Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby. Let's join Mike and Kentucky Dave as they strive to be informative, entertaining, and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Folks, welcome to episode 102. Dave, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How about you, Mike? I can't complain. I'm coming off a week of some rotten luck, but uh, <laughs> other than that, I'm pretty good. Well, good. November's upon us. and uh, Yes, it is. And the weather has turned. You got some real good modeling weather out there. Yeah, that's right. See how long it lasts. Yep. <laughs> well, my friend, what's been up in your model sphere since last time? My model sphere is moving forward. I'm I'm jazzed. Uh, I've kind of broke out of the funk. You know, it's hard to describe. I just I've, I feel good about modeling, and also I'm I'm back to reading some history books that are uh, modeling related. The model sphere is busy and buzzing. The day doesn't go by when I'm not texting or DMing with multiple modelers on multiple subjects. It's a great damn time to be alive and be a modeler. It is, in fact. How about you? Well, I tell you, I've been, uh, we'll get to it in the Benchtop Halftime Report, but I've put in quite a bit of time over the last week. Yes. A little little slower this this week so far, but hopefully we'll get there. And I've just been thinking, man... keep talking about the same projects and and I, I haven't made a lot of progress on them. I'm, I'm slower than I need to be probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think you I can find both. more time and, you well, know, TJ's and- busting my ass all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> and not, not without reason, but uh, by the same token, I, you know, one of the things I realized is that part of mine is organizational. I need to get better organized and manage time better because if I do that, I think my production will increase. I'm wondering if uh, instead of making predictions about finish dates and what show you're going to have it at and all this jazz, if uh, a better approach would be to set yourself a, an hour per week kind of challenge. You know and, that that and is see a if the, see, see if the uh, productivity doesn't follow follow behind that yeah it would oh and i think you're uh, i i think you're correct i know people who actually keep logs of their modeling you know when they go in they record their time and what they're working on now to me that seems a little too close to to what i have to do in my professional life but uh, (laughs) setting a goal of some sort is i think probably something that you need to do and i do think for me where i'm falling down and i think you can really tell it if you walked into my model room was or is organizational and related to that is time management yeah probably more time management i mean probably you can clear off your space as long as you got room enough room to work then uh I don't know how much organization you might need before that to keep the F8 going. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think, Which it uh, is. We'll talk about that. In some capacity, I think I just need to uh, put in the time. Yeah. That's that's my model sphere. Well, good. Good. Mike, we're recording. We're at the bench. I'm assuming there is a modeling fluid at hand. Well, I drank tonight's good modeling fluid last night. Because last <laughs> night was Halloween. Yes. Tonight, I'm not drinking a normal modeling fluid. Okay. I'm drinking a rather uh, lackluster uh, seltzer water. Oh, no. How did that come about? Uh, I just need to take a break, man. That's all. <laughs> now, is this a hard seltzer or just... No, no, no. no. Oh, this no, is this, just a... It's, a... It's, it's a fizzy, man. That's all it is. All it is. What is it? That's right. It's just lemon lime. Okay, but no brand name. Well, it's a store brand. Oh, okay. I'm really set to bar low tonight. Yeah, you really did. Hope you're hope you're picking up the slack. It's clear that clear to me that I need to 
to be the one to, to carry the flag here. So uh, I am drinking the last of our San Marcos Hall beers. This is uh, Shiner Orale Mexican style cerveza brewed by Spetzel Brewery in Shiner, Texas. This is the last of all of the many, many beers the listeners brought to us at the dojo when we were in San Marcos. So I'm going to put this one away tonight. I have zero doubt that I'm going to enjoy it. (laughs) I'll do better next time. That's right. You got to, hey, we got a brand to keep up, man. (laughs) Well, we need to keep up on the listener mail. Yes, I'm telling you what. And uh, been pretty good. I guess uh, people are done with summer and now they're they're right in the show again. There's some good stuff here, Dave. Let's get into it. Let's get into this, my friend. Uh, first up is uh, Mr. Branson Smith from uh, Charlestown, Indiana. So he's your neighbor. Right, right across the river. Yep. And uh, he's got an interesting question. He was discussing with some, I guess, non-modeling coworkers about current events in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And he thinks he may have been a bit rash saying that some of this stuff has inspired him to build some uh, modern AFEs that uh, he may have not before had interest in. And uh, he primarily builds World War II AFEs and aircraft. And he just wants to know if we've ever experienced any kind of pushback from non-modelers when expressing interest in, in uh, subjects such as current events or reference photos that could be graphic or whatever. And, and yeah, Some non-modelers will hear that you model and think that that's weird or unusual. Of course, you know, anybody anybody's hobby is weird and unusual to people who don't do it. But when expressing yourself regarding something that you find inspiring to model, I can see how if you express it like you would to another modeler, to a non-modeler, they're not going to get the same you know, we talk. I talk all the time about how when you meet another modeler and you start talking, you instantly already speak the language, and so you understand each other at a certain level. That's not true with the non-modeler. So if you're talking to a non-modeler and they reference a photograph that was on the front page of the newspaper showing a burned-out vehicle... And your response to them is something along of the lines of, yeah, that inspired me to to want to pick up that kit and build it. You, you can see how that, com- <laughs> that comes across as, as weird and possibly off-putting. So I think when you're talking to a non-modeler, you have to kind of filter yourself, the, apply a filter that you would not otherwise do if you were talking to another modeler. Because yeah, I, I can I can easily see how somebody would hear something that I would say to another modeler that's perfectly normal, that if I said it in the context of a normal conversation, they're like, that's weird. Yeah, I, I can see that. And I, I don't know, with typically with non modelers, I, I I tend to read the room and uh Yes poke around some other topics before I kind of talk about my modeling. That's just me. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's my thing. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. And I think a lot of people are like this. I'm fairly reticent to discuss my hobby with, with people who are casual friends or workplace acquaintances or that. Cause the hobby to me is something that is kind of private to me. And I share it with other widely with other modelers, but I don't go around telling the average person I meet that I'm a modeler or that I do a podcast or any of that stuff. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. Yeah, our, our hobbies are, I think, kind of personal to us. But this situation, I, I don't. For me personally, I don't know that I've ever experienced this. Just because of the way I, just for the reasons we just stated, it's just yeah. the way I. I don't quite have now. In, this, in my current job, a lot more people know about it than ever have. And right. my screen screensavers on my my monitors are flashing a selection of uh, builds that uh, either they're either mine or some that uh, we've seen at nationals or online somewhere that I've, I've taken that I thought were particularly cool. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty selective with those too. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. You right. Exactly. You would have to be. Yeah, because there's some nuance that uh, I think you're right. A lot of uh, the modelers may get or give you the benefit of the doubt of whether they fully right. understand or not that you're not going to get with the rest of the crowd. It, well, it also brings up, you know, border models just releasing this mark of a tank kit. And now yeah, that's probably been in development ahead of this current mess in Gaza. Right. And that one's probably coincidence. Given the fact that the lead time on production of any major market kit, you know, not from a uh, a cottage manufacturer, the lead times on those things are a year or more. But then on the flip side, you know, Dragon just announced they were going to be re-releasing a couple of their IDF subjects. Mm-hmm. That <laughs> that may be something else entirely. I, I it would not shock me to see kit manufacturers who have stuff in their back catalog that isn't in current production, but is showing up in the news, re-releasing, announcing that they're re-releasing those items because there's a natural interest in it just because it's in the news. Well, then like, you know, Masterbox is doing it. Right. And it's the war's happening to them, right? Exactly. (laughs) So, yeah. Interesting yeah. question, Branson. I don't know if we answered it well or well or not. That's uh, I just kind of play my cards close to the vest until uh, I feel comfortable that I can show them. Yeah, I guess. I guess. And his current modeling fluid is check far, so can't go oh, wrong. That, that, you listen, good check, good check, Pilsner. That is, check far is a really, really good beer. A very enjoyable, particularly a, a particularly good spring summer beer for yard work or out by the pool. Up next is Tom Karen from Kearns, Utah. And he references that High West whiskey from Utah that uh, somebody brought us in, uh, gosh, I guess that was Omaha. Yeah. And Polygamy Porter from uh, Wasatch Brewery. That's a good name. (laughs) I guess we helped him with his Japanese carrier deck info a while back. Yeah, I think we pointed him to Inch. Yeah, I think so. He says he spent $40 on a kit on eBay. I think is a, a Kawanishi E7K1 type. What is that? Uh, E7K1 is the ALF. Okay. What is, and, is this? Is this turned into Stump the Chump? I, I, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, he bought another one. Well, he, the one he bought for forty dollars was missing parts. Okay. He bought another one for twenty nine dollars on eBay. Uh huh. To get what he needed, I guess. Right. And then a week later, uh, Hasi reissued the kit with the with the catapult for twenty five dollars. <laughs> hey man, that, that's how that's how it goes. Yeah, I feel your pain. Uh, listen, this is this happens to all of us, and uh, you know all you got to do is you've got to understand that you were doing a favor for somebody else. It was your turn in the barrel. You spent the money, <laughs> and there was some guy out there waiting for the kit to get released or re-released, and you made it happen for him. So hopefully he'll do it for you sometime. Up next, our Aussie friend, Paul Gloucester. The Quokka. The world traveler. Yes, I know. Mark Copeland. Mark Copeland's going to be seeing him next week. So I envy him because I, 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 I can't wait to see Paul again. Because you're not at Telford. That's right. Well, there's that too. Well, Mr. Gloucester sent me a big, long email about uh, vacuuming stuff after he saw my post on the dojo. Right. So, Paul, I appreciate that. Your uh, your plastic source, I don't think's a, a good one. We can talk about that later. Uh, but I think I, I got a, another option for finding the material you're looking for or that, there are, or that you suggest I need to use. Uh, but he also uh, mentions for you, Dave, that he, he picks up, uh, well, he built a BF-109E. For JG27, a desert leopard kind of camo, yep. that, that one yep. gold of the national. Very, very famous photograph. So he says that uh, he had two old Hazi 109s for paint mules to, to until he got that to where he wanted it. Yeah. Before he sprayed his new special hobby 109. Yep. And he's always picking up uh, paint mules at swap meets and bargain bins. So A significant amount of the Hasegawa catalog has been superseded. But you can pick them up at, at because of that, you can pick them up at swap meets and, and shows 
for relatively inexpensive. And they're still great kits. I mean, you could still build them and they turn them into really good kits, but they are really, really good for like a paint mule. Oh, yeah. Because you could just slap, you know, the heck with the interior, you could slap the exterior together and start painting and and you've got a real, real good paint mule. I think I mentioned it way back our first year on doing the podcast that uh, I, I might start looking for some of these built, built up models at shows right to pick up a couple for paint mules yep and you know i i don't know that since i've had that line of thinking that i've been to a show yet <laughs> where anybody had anything yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's not as common as it used to be next our friend from seattle dave mark Doremus. okay out there with the seattle gang yes uh he from listening to the podcast thinks uh we're both confident about within reason what our next builds are probably going to be. And uh, like we maybe we got a short list, we talk about a short list. And yes. sometimes we say that in jest and sometimes it's serious, right? Yeah. Um, short list meaning, yeah, it's a subject I get really excited about or short list meaning, uh, yeah, it's going to come up in the next one or two projects. Right. <laughs> For the past three or four years, he's been relying on online or club group build suggestions to generate his list of what he's building next. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, I'm not going to do. Yeah, no, that's not for me. I'm great that it works for him. That's it's, right. It's not for me. That, that'd be the list of kits I'm not going to build. <laughs> right. <laughs> although, although I would hesitate to point out, you and I are both currently building a group build kit. Yes, we are. Yeah, I know I am. Yeah, we'll talk about that. <laughs> well, Mark, I don't know if you like doing group builds, and he's, I wonder if he's, I wonder if he's building for the museum like Jim is all the time. I, I think that that's at least part of it. I'm sure if that's fo- if that floats your boat and gets you moving, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, I've had struggles with that in the past. It doesn't work as well for me, although the current one's not going badly. But you know what works for you? It's you know, we talked about this. You'll have somebody who has a particular technique for doing something, and then you'll have people on the internet come along and say, oh, no, that doesn't work. Do it this way. No, that doesn't work. Do it this way. You experiment around and you find out what works for you. And if it works for you and nobody else, it still works for you. So for Mark, if that works for him to establish his short list, more power to him. Yep. I just, uh, you know, we used to do the checklist. Mm-hmm. Or the, yeah. Or the, you know, the the build list. And uh, yep. we haven't done that in a while. And that, Well, I don't think we did it last year. We did it the year before. You have to go dig up the old and see if yes. that's all just gone to hell. <laughs> yep. <laughs> up next, Louis Toledo, and he's from uh, Lancaster, California. Okay. He's uh, LT Models on social social media. Okay. I think there's a company called that too. I'm more to the same. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, his question is why isn't there an IPMS or other scale model hall of fame? Because he sees this kind of thing done in all other sorts of things car clubs, sports clubs, aviation, space clubs. You know, the closest thing IPMS has to that would be the list of the uh, judges' grand champion from all of the IPMS nationals. And I'm sure that list actually exists somewhere. You know, the list of everybody who who has won what is now known as the George Lee Trophy. Yes. But, you know, that's something I may mention to the e-board next time, that we probably ought to, somewhere on the website, have that as a list of everybody who won the judges' best in show for every national convention. That's a good idea. Thank you. I like that. And that's just one facet of it. I mean, there's, he mentions there's other modelers who've contributed something to the hobby. Oh yeah. May not be that because they may not live in the United States, but uh, interesting concept. Yeah. And I don't think he's right. I don't think there is one. No, there is. Of course, there's no drama around uh, who's getting in and not getting in this year. <laughs> that's, that's right. We don't we don't have to worry about about who's on the on the old timers list or whatever. 
Well, Dave, our friend Ken Beckler from Peoria, Illinois, in the Jack Wiselick Polish Coast Watchers chapter there. Yep. Um, was listening to episode 99 and heard the story about the Corsair and the ice cream. <laughs> and uh, he was reminded from that about a patient he had when he was a uh, physical therapist. And uh, he had a patient who was a in a P-38 squadron in the South Pacific. Well, this patient said that morale was low with, for the pilots at this particular time, and the, uh, the the acting medical officer said to fix it. So the fix it became uh, trading and getting their hands on some uh, cases of beer, which was warm because... Uh, South Pacific. South Pacific, pretty much all the time, and no refrigerators. Yep. So they had a maintenance officer cut a hinged door arrangement on a teardrop drop tank. Uh-huh. And when they built racks inside for the beer cases and they would send up a junior pilot <laughs> to do oxygen equipment check daily with the modified drop tank full of, uh, full of beers <laughs> and, uh, come back down and, uh, said the flights continued until morale improved. I, I'm telling you what, I, I, that's the re the resourcefulness of the United States military never ceases to amaze me. That's a good story. Thanks for that, Ken. That is. That's a great story. And he's another Volvo guy, and he's been crying in his beer with me, crying right. in mine. I understand. <laughs> well, finally, Dave, from the email side, Mr. Michael Karnaka from New York City. I knew that's who it was going to be. That's right. Every time I say that, that's who it's going to be. Yep. He actually sent us two, but I'm going to pick the first one he sent and save the other one. The other one's good, too. Okay. Um, he wants to know if there was something we were into heavily at some point in our modeling odyssey that fell by the wayside. Now, he says for him, he had a fascination with Soviet stuff when there was this mystique around it, you know, before the wall came down. Right. And uh, he says now it's just a no-go, no interest. <laughs> Well, I, the Soviet's always been one of my areas of interest, and it continued after the wall fell, so I didn't experience that. But I'll tell you what I have experienced is rise in pendulum swing. Fifteen years ago, I was building jets. It was post-World War II forward was what I was interested in. Then the pendulum swung, and now it's World War II and earlier. And so the pendulum tends to swing back and forth. And I'm not sure if there's a particular pattern to it, but I will say as I've gotten older, I jump I jump around a little more. Uh, I'd say if anything, as I've gotten older, my interests have widened. Anything from a submarine to a car, I'm open to nearly anything well mine is almost the exact same as his okay there was a time i guess before 92 and things started changing in the world so dramatically that uh i had a real keen interest in soviet armor modern soviet army at that time and uh, mm -hmm. i i kind of lost it and now some is coming back but i don't think it's because of current world events i just think there's some subjects out there i, I wanted to model prior and and because uh, i've had some of the kits now a while but uh right yeah as soon as soon as uh well you know dragon dml at the time right was coming out with all that stuff i guess for the time the kits were okay they weren't great but uh it was kind of the the hot thing right there was a lot yep. of uh all the it was it the old amm was current constantly running articles on how to improve these these kits that were coming out that weren't so great and there's a lot of aftermarket and resin and stuff coming out for those things to fix them and it was just oh, kind yeah. of the hot kind of the hot topic and and then i don't know if it just for a lot of people well at least for me and michael karnaka it kind of went away <laughs> keep in mind the t62 is now a modern t modern russian tank again <laughs> that's true <laughs> so that, that, you know, my answer is the same as his. That would be the one that would come to mind is, is that when the veil was lifted on that, it suddenly became less interesting. Gotcha. I can see how that would happen. Well, what's been happening over on Facebook Messenger, Dave? A Facebook mass Messenger has been very active the last two weeks. Uh, and I'm going to try and cut through these as quickly as possible. Grant Aztec reached out 
to say that my, well, he didn't say constant nagging, but let's face it, constant nagging, for people to go, if they've got a local modeling club, to go and participate. Finally encouraged him to do it. He's up in the Seattle area uh, near Jim. And so he started going to uh, the local IPMS chapter as well as the local non-IPMS chapter. Joined both and says he met a lot of really great guys, which I'm telling you, that's the that's the benefit. If you've got a local club, check it out. There are people who speak your language. Uh, he also joined IPMS USA, again, nagging, but uh, reports it's a positive experience. So I want to encourage everybody out there, if you're not a member of your local club and there is a club near you, go and check them out. You, you're going to find modeling friends and people you can share your hobby with. Jason Campbell, our friend down in Tennessee, uh, wants to know if you and I are going to be at the Murfreesboro show on uh, the 18th of November. The answer to that is, at this time, we're not sure. And he's going to gather up a bunch of the Gundam guys to try and make the trek over to bring the Gundam participation to Central Tennessee. So that's good news. Next is Julian Fisher Lamon. I apologize for if I garbled the last name. It's L-L-A-M-O-N. In any event, uh, Julian was listening to our talks about stash and kits in your stash that you have, but you're not building, etc. And he talks about he has some kits in his stash that he hesitates to build because they're either very expensive or very rare, but he gets satisfaction from knowing they're in his stash, that the simple possession of them brings satisfaction, comfort, and enjoyment to him, even though he would hesitate to actually build some of them simply because of their expense or their rarity. And again, if that if that brings you joy, no criticism. We had one like that before, right? Just the ownership was 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 satisfying. So yeah, they didn't they didn't see the stash as a problem. Our friend Stephen Lee uh, reached out and wanted to know our take and Doctor Strangebrush's take on the availability of these very inexpensive airbrushes mostly coming out of China, you know, things in the 40 to $50 range that are in many cases, solid airbrushes. And he's wondering if the availability of those is going to get modelers who otherwise might not make the leap into airbrushing to make the leap into airbrushing. I don't know. I think that's yes. I think it is too. I think it is too. And I don't think it, even though these brushes are not of the highest quality, they're certainly good for the basics. And if they get somebody in to airbrushing and then that person gets comfortable and then realizes the limitations of what they bought, then they take the next step up the ladder to maybe something a little more uh, quality and a little more expensive. So I, I think generally the answer is yes. And I don't think it's generally a bad thing. I would like to see the reviews on some of these. We'll have to talk to Mr. Lee about that. Don't you think? Uh, yeah, we will <laughs> at some point. He also sent something that he's not sure whether it was a joke or not. It was, have you ever seen a Japanese sesame ball? The little ball of dough yeah. with sesame seeds all over it. Mm -hmm. He sent something that purported to be a kit of a sesame ball with 900 parts where you attached each individual sesame seed to the, the bun portion of the model. 
Now, he, neither he nor I could figure out if this is a joke <laughs> or if this is an actual model that they sell over in Japan. Because they do sell models of of food stuff, of uh, food items. Yeah, uh, like the noodle, noodle bowl. And- noodle bowl. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've actually got the kit of the Goiza, the pot stickers. <laughs> uh, so it was funny. And uh, ni- the idea of 900 individual parts where you're putting each sesame seed on individually was was kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I could, that could go either way. Christian Gurney reached out to us, and he said, he sent me a, a message. He listened to Rob Booth's interview on the Model Geeks podcast recently. And he was so encouraged by the vision that Rob was laying out for the future of IPMS that he rejoined IPMS USA, the national organization. So I've been begging him, I've been begging people to do it. But if it took Rob Booth going on another podcast to get us another IPMS USA member, I'm willing to take that. (laughs) Well, he did a pretty good job. I, I, I got that one digested. So good. Glad it glad it had a positive result. Two last ones. One, our friend Warren Dickinson from Southern Kentucky has a bone to pick with you about your dislike of the movie Kelly's Heroes. He he maintains that it's one of the finest war movies ever made, that he particularly likes the soundtrack, and he says, You're wrong. Okay. Well, I'll be wrong. I'm not changing my mind, though. (laughs) Okay. Well, the next time Warren comes up to a model contest, you and he have to have the Kelly's Heroes discussion. Yeah. Usually uh, when I dive into a war movie, I'm not necessarily looking for escapism. So I I can't... uh, The theme song to the movie, in in my opinion, is awful. (laughs) And then I've never liked Oddball's 60s lingo and kitsch in the movie. I just... It is definitely a movie that you have to take. It's just like the movie Airplane. You have to take your brain out, put it next to your next to you on the couch, and just enjoy the movie for what the movie is. That much I would agree with. And and it's got some great lines too. <laughs> I mean, you know, who hasn't said what kind of deal? A deal, deal. I mean, I've used that line at least once every three or four months probably for 20 years. Warren, go watch it. Go watch it. Well, and he plays the soundtrack. He's got the soundtrack and he enjoys the soundtrack while he's modeling. I think he's pulling our chain (laughs) or mine anyway. Finally, Jamie Adamson of IPMS Houston wanted to a invite us down to Houston next year on May 4th, 2023 for their a local model contest and wanted to get a mention of the fact that IPMS Houston is holding a model contest May 4th, 2020, I'm sorry, May 4th, 2024. Sorry about that. 2024 next year. And they're, they're using a, op, um, a modified open system with gold, silver, bronze awards and, uh, He's inviting everybody down. We'll probably mention that again when it's closer to the time for the show. But he asked us to mention it, and we are more than happy to do so. All right. Well, between that show and uh, PaxCon, it's GSB thing getting trendy. I don't know. I I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Pittsburgh's done it for years, so who knows? Well, that's all we got, Dave. It is indeed. This is the point in the show where I ask you to rate our show on whatever podcast app you're listening on. Give us five stars. Help us grow the audience. Our audience continues to grow. And uh, a lot of it is due to you all out there. Also, if you've got a modeling friend who doesn't currently listen to our podcast, please recommend us to them. 
It's one of the best ways for us to grow our audience, help them out if they need uh, a little bit of guidance on how to get a podcast listening app and and uh, subscribe to Plastic Model Mojo. We appreciate it. And we're not the only podcast out in the model sphere by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if you'd like to tune into what else is going on on the podcast front, you can go to www.modelpodcast.com. That's model podcast plural. It's a consortium website set up with the help of Stuart Clark from Scale Model Podcast up in Canada. And you can go to that URL and click on the banner links for all the other shows who are participating in the spirit of cross promotion with us. And uh, we just re up that thing. So uh, I want to send a thanks out to all the other podcasts who ponied up and uh, help us uh, support Stuart in uh, making that possible. And uh, I need to go to him on to possibly uh, getting our blog and YouTube favorites up there for the other podcasts, you know, for the other yeah. stuff as well. Stuff like Sprue Pie with Fret, Stephen Lee, a great blog, and uh, he's going to be a guest here in an upcoming episode, uh, probably 104, I think, mm-hmm. is we're going to get him on. So that's not going to be too long down the road. Uh, Jim Bates, Scale Canadian TV. He's got his YouTube channel. Chris Wallace, Model Airplane Maker, blog and YouTube channel, and uh, a good friend of ours. So uh, always looking to see what uh, Chris has got going on, and uh, hopefully he's all settled in his new workspace and is going to be cranking out some new content. And we've got uh, the Inch High Guy, Jeff Groves, the Inch High Guy blog. You can get on there and take in all his 70-second scale goodness. Uh, sure you like that, Dave. I do. I absolutely do. And he's, he is prolific as all get out. And so there's always something new. And finally, Evan McCallum, Panzermeister 36. Please check out his YouTube channel for all your armor modeling and weathering goodness. Yep. He did a very recent uh, video drop on the recent Capcom show. So it's worth taking a look. If you're not a member of IPMS USA, the National Organization, or IPMS Canada, for those of you who live in the Great White North, or whatever country you live in, if you're not a member of your national IPMS organization, please join. It's a group of guys who give up part of their modeling time to grow the hobby and to do a lot of things behind the scenes that makes the hobby better. So I'd appreciate it if you would consider joining IPMS USA or your local, your national organization in whatever country you happen to be in. In addition, if you're an armor modeler with an interest in armor, join uh, AMPS, the Armor Modeling Preservation Society. It is a modeling organization in many ways like IPMS USA, but it's focused on armor modeling and uh, a great group of people. And uh, I can highly, highly recommend you joining. Well, Dave, let's have a word from our sponsor. You got it. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder steam back airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory-grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. Well, Dave, it's the All-American Red, White, and Blue, the 2024 National Convention of the International Plastic Modeler Society, USA. This will be here before you know it, man. Well, it's going to be here in 258 days. It's coming quick, like a freight train. Well, I know Rob Booth on the Model Geeks podcast had a lot to say about the buzz around it and what a great job Jeff Hearn's doing, keeping the excitement going and uh, trying trying to encourage some new things to be going on there. Yes. We're still early in the, uh, the show planning cycle, and uh, as far as information on the national convention goes right. you can go to nats 2024 uh the website for the convention and uh you can keep up with all the latest news there as we're still you know registration is not going to open until we get into the new year but uh, we'll be on top of that and uh hopefully get jeff on here uh, yep. ar- around that time to uh give us the big pitch on the show this time right here between now and january is the time when All of those guys up there are working feverishly, but those of us who are going to go and enjoy the show, there's not much stuff that you see on on our end. Once the new year happens and they announce the 
hotel availability and then registration and uh, start soliciting for uh, trophy packages. It's going to come thick and fast in the new year. Well, folks, our special segment tonight is uh, another segment on cannabis and clear parts. And uh, this time around, we've got our good friend, Mr. Steve Hustad, with us again. And uh, we had a nice casual conversation about uh, the way he handles those things and uh, got a lot of good information out of it. Absolutely. It was fantastic. Well, let's let everybody hear it. You got it. Dave, we've got our friend of the show, Mr. Steve Hustad, back again. Steve, how are you doing tonight? I'm good this evening. How are you guys doing? Not bad. Not bad at all. I'm struggling with tonight's topic, so hopefully we'll uh, we'll shed some light on improving canopies and the dealing with these pesky clear parts. Oh yeah. But before before we get rolling too far, how about the uh, how about the uh, elevator version of your recent travels? Oh, the elevator version? <laughs> the <laughs> okay, quick es- version. Escal- just the ups and downs? Es- escalator. Yes. Oh, just the ups <laughs> and downs. Yeah, I was supposed to be on your 99 uh, um, uh, podcast. but I, And by the way, uh, congratulations on your 100th. That's a that's a big deal. Well, thank you. So that's yeah. a, a nice episode. Nice uh, uh, call-ins with uh, a lot of people and a lot of allocates you guys really deserved. So that well, was really you. fun to listen to. Um, as to the trip, yeah, we t- we had a planned uh, trip for a kind of a combined World War One, World War Two battlefields tour trip, and it was supposed to be in October of 2020. <laughs> yeah, but I've, then, I've, I've heard this song before. Yeah, <laughs> did something happen in 2020 that would have prevented you from going? Well, yeah, a little <laughs> bit. So, so we get we put it off, and the next year it's like nobody wanted to go on a trip and wear a mask and all that BS. Right. So, so then we. <clears throat> we put it off to this year, but we, uh, um, it was about 10 days and flew into, uh, uh, Paris and then took a, a coach to Cannes, spent a couple nights in Cannes and, and saw a lot of sites around there. Tried to hit a couple that, uh, John Bonani mentioned, mm-hmm. but, um, Cannes is a beautiful city too. And then from there went into, uh, Normandy and did the beaches and did the tourist thing, collected some sand from Omaha beach, you know, and yeah. all that good stuff. And, and then from there, back to Paris for a night, uh, for a day, and did the touristy stuff there. And, um, and then from there, we went to uh, Belgium, through Belgium to Bastogne, and, and toured a lot of the, uh, the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge sites, and saw a lot of those uh, places that we'd only kind of read about a lot in the Battle of the Bulge. The, you've seen the Battle, uh, the Band of Brothers, I'm sure you've seen yeah. that series, and there's a lot of... Uh, Saw the the actual forest where the you know the bombardment took place in the snow with the treetops falling on the guys and and the the, the trench lines and foxholes they dug and and uh, saw a lot of uh, uh, went to the Bastogne Museum which is quite nice and saw the, the local graveyard where there's a lot of things going on uh, during the battle and the church there's a church scene in that uh, the church that was in the the movie or in the Band of Brothers we saw that too and where they had wounded in the church. And then from where there, we went on to uh, Weimar, which is a beautiful city in Germany on the east uh, side. Spent most of our time in the east part of Germany um, and uh, saw some sites uh, that were associated with the Weimar Republic. And then from there, went on to uh, to Buchenwald, spent a day at the Buchenwald concentration camp and went through the a museum, fabulous museum they have there. And the... Uh, kind of a visitor's center, but of course it's a, a pretty solemn oh, yeah. site. So, but uh, very educational. It was kind of an educational tour. Now, why did you all tr- choose Buchenwald as opposed to Auschwitz? You know, Auschwitz seems to be the the one that, the iconic one. Is it just yeah. Buchenwald was close to where you were? Or? I think so. It was closer. It's only five miles from Weimar. Oh, okay. I did not realize yeah. that. Yeah. So it's... Uh, and then from there, we went on to uh, Berlin for a few days and uh, saw where the, the Führer bunker was, which is now a parking lot, and <laughs> and the Reichstag building and all those other things. Then we, a little Cold War, Cold War action after that, and we uh, toured the areas where, you know, Checkpoint Charlie and, um, you know, the, the, the Berlin Wall fragments were there and, and 
all that. So it was, it was a really, uh, really good, but it was, it was like being on a treadmill the whole time though, but we saw an awful lot. Uh, it was a tour put on by ACIS, which is kind of an educational group, but uh, they did right. a fabulous job and uh, we were up early and just go it all day, but saw an awful lot of stuff in a short time. So what was your favorite museum? What was the one thing out of that whole trip that if you only got you're only going over and were able to see one thing what's the one thing you would recommend and i'm talking not the louvre or something like that but no yeah it took, history yeah, to, related yeah you know i didn't care for paris that much um but i loved con but i think yeah. my favorite was bastogne i think the the city was just fabulous and the countryside is is really nice, and there's a lot of history around there. So I enjoyed myself in in, in uh, Belgium and Bastogne most day. I think. Well, Mike still got that one to redo. I do. Let's get on into this, Steve. Yeah. Clear parts and canopies. Clear parts and canopies. I I know yeah. uh, you're primarily, if not exclusively, seventy second scale. So. Uh, 70 second scale clear parts are probably a little more predisposed for problems than, uh, some of the larger scales. Yeah, I think you're right because, uh, it's one of those kind of the bane of the existence of the modeler along with, um, I think, uh, John Miller, uh, Dr. Strange breath mentioned, um, clear coats is another yeah. thing that gives people fits. And I know clear parts, um, canopies, and like Mike mentioned, uh, you get you get a lot of scale differences in aircraft kits, especially that where the larger the scale, I think the more acceptable the clear parts are likely to be. Right. Whereas in 72nd, you're dealing, of course, much smaller scale. And just because of the limitations on the plastic injection process, you're uh, often faced with pieces that are way too thick. I can remember some of the Airfix kits that were produced in the 60s. Remember those? Oh, God. <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I joked the other night that some of those kits, it might have been better if the canopy was just a solid piece of <laughs> Like an airliner desktop model or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, some of those things are... Calling those clear parts is is um, maybe stretching the definition of the word clear. Yeah, that's, that's generous. Yeah. <laughs> so, but things have improved. Um, but uh, I remember, what was it... Uh, Oh, probably around 2000 or even before 1990s, I think Falcon, uh, yeah. New Zealand, the company uh, started producing a lot of very nice uh, vacuform clear parts for specific kits. Yep. And I was buying those up. And uh, of course, in 70 second scale, a lot of them needed it, and especially the older kits. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I say, with the, with the 30 second scale or quarter scale, you're far more likely to find an acceptable canopy. But I think um, even with modern kits, uh, I would love to see Falcon uh, start up and do modern kits. They seem to have stopped after a certain point and right. don't do anything. Um, but uh, the big differences I've noticed is, well, I built a, the ICM's DO-17Z kit in 72nd scale a couple of years ago, and it's a very nice kit. Yeah. And they, actually the clear parts are quite nice too, except... The nose piece, um, that kind of beetle-eyed nose piece on the DO-17Z was still too thick. And you could look at it from the front and you could look around the perimeter and you could see the distortion in the plastic even when the uh, uh, framing's painted. So I had to replace that with a, a heat and smash technique we'll talk about later. But clear parts are kind of very important to aircraft models. And as Dave, I'm sure knows, it's uh, you know what's the first thing that catches your eye when you're was, going down to look at a model. I was going to say this is this is my theory, and let me know if you agree with it. the The clear parts are the most important part of an aircraft model because the best model in the world with a poorly done canopy immediately your attention draw is drawn to canopy. Whereas if the model might be slightly poorly executed in other ways, but if the canopy is really well done, it tends to take the eye away from the other stuff and toward the canopy. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, <laughs> It's like what catches the eye first when you're kind of bearing in on a model on a table, uh, aircraft model. Yeah. I always look at the canopy first. And if, 
And sadly, if if the canopy is cloudy, askew, thick, badly painted, you know, you're just not inclined to look at the rest of the model. Yep. So, I agree. Or if it if it looks way out of scale and it's just way too thick on the edges, which is a problem we have in 72nd scale, it's the same thing. It just destroys the whole effect of the model. So I think uh, concentrating on canopies and clear parts is, is pretty good because once you get past that, and if, if that looks good, then the rest of it starts to look good. And people start to look at the model in more detail then. But if the canopy puts them off, they're kind of on to the next one. In time. Yeah. At this point in your building, do you ever use the kit canopy? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that That's encouraging. I would, I, to be honest with you, I, I, I got a chance. I yeah. was going to, exactly, Mike. That was, my, <laughs> that was my thinking exactly. I thought his answer was going to be no, and I was going to be heartbroken. <laughs> So you're telling me there's a chance, yeah? <laughs> so, exactly. exactly. Like some of the, like some of the. Um, well, you mentioned uh, working on a Hasegawa B24 eventually, right? And I think um, likely the canopy clear part for that will be perfectly usable. Yeah. Whereas the the nose piece may need replacement. Yeah. And I built the the Hasegawa HE111H a while back. And the whole nose piece itself, I mean, the, that, you know, that whole uh, enlarged right. cockpit where they all sit up in the front, that was actually usable. It was nice and clear. I could thin the edges and it uh, it fit the, the fuselage beautifully. But what I did on the very nose of the HE-111 is that little little bubble where the, the gun where comes Where the gun through. is, yeah. And that was way too thick, and I had to replace that one part. So you saw it all... You- Okay. <laughs> that that was a separate piece in the kit. Oh, okay. Thank God. <laughs> so, yeah. And well, but so that's something else you can mix and match, but right. the older the kit, the more likely it is you'll have to replace it with a vac or um even some of the like even the new Edward uh 109F Messerschmitt 109F kit and but you know the the clear parts in that kit still look too thick to me. Huh. So and I wondered, you know, Edward does the brass and then they do the photo etch and they do the resin and they do the engines and they do, why can't they do uh, vac replacement canopies for their own kits? They do all the other stuff. So you're, you're right. I mean, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to do that. Um, right. You know, a company like Rob Torres or, or uh, well, if it was Japanese, maybe dead design. Mm-hmm. Might might do a replacement canopy, but yeah, there's no reason that Edward themselves couldn't get into that business. Don't their countrymen over at Special Hobby throw some vac canopies into some of their stuff? They uh, they used to. Okay, when when Special I don't Hobby good or not, but right. Well, Special Hobby was a much shorter run business. A lot of times, their kits came with vac canopies as the only choice. Right. Way back, way back in the beginning, and that was just a matter of of technology. Because uh, you know, we we talk about clear parts being thicker and all. Apparently, cl- clear styrene is much, in addition to being more brittle, is much more difficult to mold. Mm, okay. And, I don't know why. I, you know, we'd have to have somebody in the injection molding industry to tell us why that's the case. But well, I think it's it's it hard to mold and have it optically clear like you want it. Maybe that, yeah, yeah. And if you have if you have pieces that are mostly flat um, versus like that, the the very nose of the HE one eleven, which is just a dome, mm-hmm. that makes a big difference. So, yeah, if they're if they're flat, they're more likely to be usable and clear. If they're domed and small, no. <laughs> but so that's. But I love the. I love those Falcon canopies, and that's the sets. I always get the sets. They're made in New Zealand. Yep. And they're beautifully done. And but they're now mostly made for older older kits now, and it's hard to uh, find in find those for for more recent kits. But I mean, some of them, like the. Uh, F6F Hellcat canopy was made for the Hasegawa kit, mm-hmm. but at least the center section, my understanding, can be used for the much newer Edward kit. Right, right. 
Yeah, and that's that's a good point because I was just finishing the um, uh, the sword G four M Betty yes. G four M one. Yeah, and that has uh, it's mostly usable. I think the the cockpit uh, the canopy over the main cockpit would be usable, but the rest of it I really needed something else. So um, I did pull out the Falcon set, which is intended for the old Hasegawa kit, which was probably vintage nineteen seventy. Oh yeah, cut all the pieces out. And they fit. So a lot of times you can use these older Falcon back canopies for newer kits. And a lot of people don't uh, really understand that or don't even try that. But it's if you've got the set, cut them out and try them. And sometimes it just takes a little adjustment to make it fit. And I was very pleased that the, those all those canopies, those uh, the Falcon set made for the ancient Hasegawa fit that sword kit, just like a glove. You can't ask for the better than that. The... the- the golden ticket and all that is the, the cut out and adjust. Um, Vacuform canopies tend to be a little intimidating for people. Yeah, that's the tricky part is getting them off without damaging them. <laughs> so they've got a, a backing, and sometimes the plastic is a little stiff. Um, they're nice and clear. Uh, what I do is I put a brand new number 11 X Acto knife blade in the holder, and you can take some uh, Tamiya tape. And you can put that along where the cut needs to be. Because mm-hmm. sometimes, unless it's just at the right perfect angle to the light, it's hard to see where to make the, the cut. Right. So if you can find that and put a little strip of tape there and then just be patient and just score it and score it and score it, put a little more pressure each time and eventually you'll um, pop them loose. And then what I do is trim them up uh, gently with the, the blade and then it's just a, a test and fit, test and fit onto the model itself. And you can do that with um, just trial and error. And if you, you wreck one, you can get another one. <laughs> and sometimes... <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> You're telling me that Steve Hustad wrecks a canopy occasionally? Um, I've been uh, known to wreck or lose one. <laughs> okay. Again, there's still hope. Yeah. So, Or else I'll, I'll, what usually happens is I'll cut it out. It'll fit beautifully, and then I'll drop it on the floor, and I'll roll over it with my chair. Oh! <laughs> so, okay. and then it's then you have to wait, you know, for another the Hannah's order two weeks later to arrive with the new canopy. But yeah, well, let me <laughs> ask you a question. This is the current bane of Mike's existence. Mm-hmm. You've got the canopy cut off. Either you're using the injection kit canopy, or you've got the uh, vacuum foam canopy cut and trimmed. Everything's great. And you're ready to attach it to the model. Do you mm-hmm. dip yours in future or not? No. Okay. Um, I did that once, mm-hmm. and then I masked it. Mm-hmm. And then when taking the masks off, some of the future came off with the mask. Mm. And another time, I have to use a needle nose tweezers to get under the corner of the mask to pull it up. Right. And I think with future on it, sometimes the needle nose tweezers can leave a a dimple in the surface if it's been futured. I know a lot of people do that and they get away with it and it looks great, but I don't do that. What I do is I, I I cut them out, I fit them and then uh, mask them and then do the paint colors. Of course, the interior color first always. Right. I've made that mistake early on too. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) and, uh, then <clears throat> what I do after you pull the masks off at the very end, after the thing's flat coated and everything, is I'll take a brush with some future, and within each pane of glass between the frames, I'll I'll brush coat the future on quickly with a brush. Huh? And that dries just perfectly flat and levels out. I add a little bit of um, unicorn tears to it though. Oh, do you? Yeah. Huh? Is that- because future sprays beautifully, that. yeah, with unicorn tears. So, Well, let me ask you a related question, and this is one that Mike asked me uh, the other day. Do you mask your canopies off the model or on the model? Do you mask and then attach, or do you attach and then mask? Depends on the model. With the, that, was uh, my, that was my answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the G4M1 Betty. I put as many of the the canopies on the model first and then got them blended and fared in. And then I masked them because I had to, some of the the camouflage division lines would go through the canopy. 
you know, and I just wanted to make that all sprayed at once. Right. And, and also the same with the nose piece and that I left, I think I left the side blisters off and I painted those independently because those were all going to be one color. Right. And I could put them on at the end. And that's another thing putting, what do you glue them on with? Um, I was going to add, thank you. I was, you are anticipating my, my questions. Well, of course the regular, uh, regular, like, you know, to me, a super thin or whatever, um, right. or, uh, the flexophile types of cement don't work on the kind of vac form uh, right. plastic. So what I do is I finally settled on uh, gorilla glue, the clear variety. They make really? several types. Yeah. They make several kinds of gorilla glue. Right. And I went down to mm-hmm. home Depot and I found one in a blister pack on a, you know, a card holder and it's uh, the clear type and it comes in a, bottle that's um, kind of a flattish bottle like an Elmer's glue bottle but it's maybe you know four inches tall a couple inches wide but it's clear and it comes out perfectly clear but it dries strong as hell so mm-hmm. that's, and I tested this with some spare canopies on a uh, on a uh, another uh, mule I had just to make sure it was tough and it would withstand pulling masks off and kind of handling so if I had to put it on before I painted it or even after if but primarily before because it's very strong. So I use that and it takes a long time to set up. That's the downside to it. Right. So I I put it on with a toothpick and then put it in and you can use a toothpick to kind of blend in around the sides and use a little bit of uh, a very small Q-tip to kind of wipe away the excess and let it sit overnight. And then in the next morning, it'll be very strong. It would take a lot of effort to pry that off. But the beauty of Gorilla Glue, it doesn't fog the canopy. Right. And uh, CA will. Um, I've heard if it's futured ahead of time, it won't. And I think that's true. It is generally true, but you never want to be the one time that it isn't true. Right. So I don't take the chance. (laughs) Right. So I I use Gorilla Glue. And if if I put them on after the model's painted, like the side blisters on the Betty. Right. Um, I put those on with just with Elmer's white glue. Okay. And then I dilute some of that. And then with a small brush, I can fill in, you know, kind of fill in around the perimeter, let that dry and then take some of the original paint and kind of brush that on top. And then you can right. take some dull coat on a brush and, you know, blend that in. So that's what I do to, to glue these on. So, okay. All right. And I'm sure other people have some ideas too, but uh, I gotta I'm go not get saying some mine are the glue. best, but that's what I <laughs> yeah. do. Mike, that, that's exactly what I was thinking. I got to go get some <laughs> clear Gorilla Glue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the biggest frustration with that stuff is that um, it takes a long time to dry. Well, as slow as I model, that is not an issue. Okay. <laughs> but the nice thing, it never fogs and it dries perfectly clear. So if you'd make a little mess... Um, mm-hmm. you're not going to notice it. I don't- now, w- when you apply it and you glue the, ca- okay, I'm not as neat as you are. So mm-hmm. we're going to assume that I have glued my model, my canopy to my model, and that there is a little excess Gorilla Glue, mm-hmm. clear Gorilla Glue, right right where the canopy and the, the fuselage meet. I assume it can be cleaned up with water on a brush. Um, before it sets. Right. Obviously. Yeah. 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 It's, I take a, just a, one of those, um, those Tamiya Q-tips, the real small ones. Yeah. The, the ones with the point. Yeah. They're po- almost pointed, but they're, they're still kind of a Q-tip yes. and they're have a soft edge, but they're a lot smaller and I, I kind of dampen those and, and with water and you can remove it that way and kind of use that to okay. blend. That's so. good. Good news. Good to yeah. hear. So yeah, but I, I just don't want to take a chance with with super glue on that stuff. And right, I get to see you know peeling the masks off after it's all painted and the whole inside's cloudy or something. Or <laughs> or worse yet, no, the whole inside isn't cloudy. There's just one cloudy spot right, yeah. really C- corner of one pane. Yeah, yep. the corner of <laughs> one pane, but it's prominent because again, like you said, you look at a model, the f- aircraft model. The first thing you look at is the canopy, yep. and that's the first darn thing you're going to see. Yep. Is it clear? Is it, are the frames neatly painted? Is there any glue mess on it? Is it fit well? Does yep. it look too thick? Yeah. All that. Yep. 
<clears throat> so, Mike, what'd you end up with on your Paul? You said, is it a, a vac or do you use the original? No, it's 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 the kit canopy for now. Oh, it is. Did you have yeah. two of them? I had two kits and Dave gave me a third. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did was I, I started trying to make a buck out of one of the kit retracted canopies to, to vac it. And two things became apparent. One was that uh, if I'm going to be a neophyte vacuum former, probably a clear part for my clear canopy for my latest projects. Probably not the best thing to start with. <laughs> okay. Well you, well, you started with a hard one. That's yeah, a, I did. Um, yeah. And then the other thing was that the, well, it's, it's related, but uh, as a secondary concern to that would be that the framing was soft enough that uh, trying to cheat and just go over a, a, a pull over the, the exterior of the kit canopy mm -hmm. was, was not going to give me very good framing. Okay. Now I was going to ask, f first of all, it amazes me that with the canopies that you do, that you're still, as I understand it, you're plunge molding vacuform canopies when you're doing a make your own. Right. You're not, you don't have one of those Chinese dental vacuforms or. I don't have one of those fancy schmancy things. No. <laughs> Fancy schmancy. <laughs> the dental so, ones that are made for mouth guards and such, but right, exactly. Yeah. Or an old Maddie Mattel, which I actually do have. Yeah. Uh, you can actually you can buy those um dental ones on Micromark though. I think they're 160 bucks or something. You can actually get them much cheaper than that, and that's what Mike did. Oh no, okay. It wasn't cheaper, but uh, it's well better. it's better. better. I promise you that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um but what I was gonna ask is when you're smash molding a, a canopy, mm -hmm. do you ever, I have, I have heard of the technique. If you've got a canopy where the frames are kind of soft, mm -hmm. taking and going over the canopy frames with um, like Tamiya tape or something like very thin Azu tape to basically make another set of frames on top of your, your, buck your mole the thing you're gonna smash mold over yeah you can do that if you if you've made a male mold that's like fairly smooth okay you can take um actually electrical tape will work for that too okay and well, what do uh, you do um i usually i used to use electrical tape but for 70 second scale it always came out uh too soft looking on the on the the heat the smashed canopy yeah. <clears throat> so now what I do is I just leave it off and I, I, I just leave a smooth surface and I'll mask the replacement that I've made mm -hmm. and uh, just you can build it up with paint. Or as I suggested to Mike with the uh, Paul canopy, because he was saying he thought the framing on the original looked a little soft, is you can take um, clear decal film. Mm -hmm. And what I've done there is take some, take some very fine, like steel wool or something and just kind of rough up the surface a little bit. Yeah. So it has a little tooth and then spray it with the interior color and then spray it with the over on camo color. And then you can cut that into strips and you can use that as your framing. Right. And Barry original. Numeric does that with a lot of his canopies. I yeah. Know. And, and his stuff looks gorgeous. So that's, yes. uh, that's, I've done that too. And then, then you get kind of a natural buildup of thickness on the frame that way. Otherwise you can let the paint as it collects on the edge of the mask will, right. some, will often give you enough of a, uh, uh, a relief that it shows. But yeah, I, I used to put the mask on the master or on the framing on the mask or on master, but it it just they came out too soft looking. But gotcha. And I've got uh, well, I've a, a on heat and smash stuff. I, I don't only use it. I don't only use it for canopies, but you can make um, engine cowlings and right. other dome things with it, and any kind of odd shape uh, like landing gear doors. All you yeah. need is just fashion up a male mold and you know, stuff it full of like epoxy sculpt or something so it won't distort in the heat. Mount it up um, on a piece of sprue and clamp it into a uh, um, a small desk uh, vice clamp. And then a candle and then the plastic. And then after about four or five, six tries, you got a, a couple pretty good <laughs> examples. <laughs> and, and one trip, one tip, um, mm -hmm. Since some of that clear plastic is kind of expensive if you get it through Micromark, but what I do is I save those clear plastic covers that come on greeting card boxes, 
I don't know if you know. I was that. you you were you anticipated my next question. What material do you use? I mean, I've heard of thermoform, acetate, mm-hmm. you know, all sorts of different materials being suggested for being the best material to vac form clear parts from. Yeah, I've used. I don't like acetate. It tends to be a little brittle and kind of thick, and it 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 doesn't seem to to soften uniformly. But um, in, if it was in a professional machine like Mike has, it might work just fine. But I use the uh, the Christmas card box covers on from you know papyrus cards or any kind of greeting cards. Gotcha. So I have friends save those and, and cut those out, and that pl- plastic works just wonderfully for uh, canopies. I wonder what it is. I, um, when, when I posted that buck I was trying to make on the on the page, I got a couple of uh, informative responses, and one of them came from our our Aussie friend Paul Gloucester. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. And uh, you know he's a fabulous modeler. Oh, yeah. He and uh, he does a lot of this too. And he recommended he gave me a supplier for a Pet G P E T G, which is a polyester. Clear polyester. I wonder if that's okay. what the greeting card box tops are. It could be for use in the vac machine. Mean yes. Okay. It might work for you too with the squash mold, but uh, that's another that's a material that he uses quite often. Okay. Hmm. Can he pick that up uh, kind of inexpensively? I uh, I don't know. I haven't checked the link yet. Because uh, before tonight's uh, podcast, I was actually looking on uh, online for this stuff, and the the stuff they sell in like 11 by 14 inch sheets, but you get six sheets for like $35. And I just didn't, <laughs> that seemed kind of high and you know how cheap modelers are. So, well, but let's face it. The alternative is going to all of your neighbors and going, Hey, can I have the tops from your, your Christmas card boxes? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I don't want the candy you're handing out tonight, but I just, want to... <laughs> right. Can but if you, you get some me... spare box covers lying around, I'll take those. <laughs> uh, you've already got me thinking. I know there are about a half dozen upstairs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Go confiscate those. And then your wife will wonder, wonder what happened to the, to the covers. on them. So. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. The heat and smash technique is uh, something I kind of taught myself. But like I say, you just make the master and and mount it up on a sprue, and you can you know drill into the epoxy sculpt that you pack the master with, so it doesn't distort under the heat. And uh, get a small vise on your desk and a candle and just a whole bunch of plastic and just you can make uh, the gear. I, I scratch built some gear doors for the DO two seventeens on that. Cause the, the ones in the Italeri kit were just too thick. So. Oh, way too thick. So you don't, okay. Two things. One, you're still using. A f- okay. Let me rephrase. You're still using a candle as your heat source rather than like a coffee mm-hmm. cup warmer or, uh, uh, Yep, that just <laughs> that just amazes me. Well, you get, of course, you can't let it hang over the flame too often. Right. But you, you kind of move it around and back and forth and then up and down and until you get kind of uniform softness in it and then right. pull it off and plunge now, it down is, over the mold. Is there a particular incantation that you're reciting as you do this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got yeah. the pent. You've got don't the catch pent- on fire. Don't catch on fire. Don't catch, <laughs> don't on, catch on fire. On fire. Yeah. <clears throat> right, right. That's right. I thought you know he's got the pentagram on the floor around oh, yeah. the candle, and yeah. now my wife will say, "What's that smell?" That's what I get. So I get yeah. the matches, you know, that to light the candle with. But it's uh, it, it seems to work. If you get a nice scent, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that could actually that could actually be pleasant. Right. <laughs> yeah, it seems to work pretty well. I've made I've made uh, engine cowlings and, uh, like I say, gear doors and um, and you and you've never been tempted to go and buy one of those Chinese dental machines and which has the heat source and the slide and the the platen that you mount the buck, your buck on and I probably should. I don't know. But <laughs> so. well, Lord knows, it's not like you could get much better. <laughs> so, well, this this works for me, and every time I do it, I don't think I'll be doing it again. But you know, the next model, I'm always doing it again, so I probably should just do that. I don't know. If I don't I listen? Don't let me be the one to tell you to change what you're doing. 
yeah, it, it works. Um, the tough part, of course, is cutting them out. And again, even with the homemade heat and smash canopies, um, a fresh exacto blade works best. And you can kind of trim them along the edge of the master itself. And that's, that is kind of nice because then unlike the Falcon canopy or the other squadron, which is actually repackaged Falcon. Right. You have to, uh, you know, mark where you're going to make your cut. And I, like I say, I do that with masking tape, but on you know, your own concoctions, you can use the master itself as the guiding edge for cutting out uh, the edge. And that tends to work pretty well. I offered yeah. to do a canopy for, for yeah. Mike, or Mike there, but well, I may still let you just to, okay. just to see what it ends up looking like. Is, yeah. Is I'd be a, happy to knock one off for you. Unless, unless I use the gorilla glue, I, I was going to put on, on with a method. I could get it back off without too much hassle there mm. you go because <laughs> act, actually the the forward section the pilot's part of and windscreen of the uh the full greenhouse the you know the unretracted version of the canopy actually fits the, the windscreen section fits the fuselage better than the retracted section now did the kit come with the windscreen separate or was that molded no, with the rest of it it's molded with the rest so you had of to it. saw that off yeah no uh, what what i what i salvaged from the greenhouse canopy i cut up was i, I cut it I cut it just forward of the retracted section. The retracted section. Okay, the pilot's uh, sliding well, section. Well, no, just after the retracted section. No, the, the, we're a, talking the retracted section at the back end where the gunner is. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, the, I see. The, okay, the second seat. All right. And I sanded it back to the to the framing, mm-hmm. and I took the retracted canopy and I cut it just forward of the frame, and I sanded it. Well, I cut it at the frame. I sent it back just to the edge of the the forward edge of the glazing on the first panel. Okay. And then I made the two. So I ended up with an exact duplicate of the kit retracted canopy, but it didn't have the mold flaw in it because the the greenhouse is gated differently than the retracted version in the kit. So okay. you didn't, there, the flow lines weren't in there. Well, yeah, those long greenhouse Japanese canopies are tough, especially the ones like at the at the rear end where they all slide into each other. Yep. And, and you got like what, three of them all together and they're just all, yeah, that's, that's tough to, to reproduce. But. Let's talk about that a little bit. Cause you, yeah. you were, we were talking about it earlier. I'm sure some folks would benefit and I suspect maybe on your little, uh, our auto one ninety six, you had to deal with that a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I did. And I, I think I sent you a couple texted photos of a, a Jill and a Judy yep. that I did. Um, oh boy, probably 25, 30 years ago, but what I did there, I kind of opted for a little bit of opt- optical illusion and uh, cut off the rear. And the last piece I wanted to remain closed, usually the fixed segment of the long greenhouse canopy. And right. and then I heat and smash that. And then for the pieces that slide into it from the rear, I think there were two more. I just went for the optical illusion and I, I cut out, I, I made two masters that were slightly smaller and then slightly smaller again, heat and smashed a couple on there and I took two sections that were probably not more than an eighth inch long and push those in. And then the other one in. So if you look at it close enough, you'll see that, that you don't see the, the there's framing. not a whole canopy section. Under that's the... right. That's okay. right. Oh, that's, that's cheap. Oh man. That's <laughs> that, what a great idea, but it works because you're, nobody's ever going to notice that, the whole canopy section is not slid up under that. Yeah. That's, that's tricky. That's yeah, I'll, tricky. I'll send you photos of that. It's like when I'm, when I'm telling my wife, I'm going to do the podcast tonight and she says, there's no video with it. How do you tell, how do you show people what you're doing? Or, and I say, well, we just kind of have to explain it. And I says, well, how's that work? And it's like, so, well, it but, is a challenge. That's why we have the dojo yeah. where we can post photographs, by the way, Thank you for posting all of the photographs from the MMSI show. That oh. was that was some incredible stuff. Oh, there's that's always such a great show, and and uh, this year they had uh, Shep Payne's box dioramas on display, or about yeah. half of them that he'd done, and and uh, Jim DeRigatis had uh, um, been lovingly restoring these things, and uh, so it's it's been a lot of work. I was talking to him and down there, and and. And he was describing it on his podcast, Small Subjects. Yeah. Um, the corrosion and the old, the old, uh, 
what do they call it? Grain of wheat bulbs and the yeah, batteries yeah. and all yeah. these other things that, that <laughs> Shep was using back then. He's replacing them all with LEDs and modern wiring and, yeah. and, uh, but he did just a fabulous job. And, and, and then, uh, a lot of the figures needed some touch up and apparently some, you know, a lot of the figures, uh, when you're using like lead foil or, or lead, sometimes yeah. a little bleed through the paint with age. Yep. Yes. And uh, so he's, he's having to put, you know, like barrier coats down and repaint portions and, but he did a beautiful restoration job on the ones that were on display there. And I think he said Shep had done maybe 25 box dioramas and I think 12 or 13 were there. Wow. He had one taken apart that has, was just beginning the restoration process. You can kind of see what they were starting with and it was, it was pretty rough, <laughs> but. Well, I had the privilege of seeing a number of those dioramas, uh, uh, you know, way back when in the nineties. Unbe for the time, unbelievable. Now, with, like you say, the LEDs and the modern wiring and the modern batteries and and the modern controls, you mm -hmm. know. But he was doing stuff with what we would consider primitive technologies and just producing amazing results. Right. Well, that's, that's, you know, all he had and did fabulous work with it. And, right. and in addition to, I think the 12 or 13 of his box dioramas that were there, they had uh, another five or six, um, kind of the same vintage from other people. So they had them all lined up there and it was really a nice, uh, nice display. A couple of, about a year earlier, I think they had a lot of, um, Shep's dioramas that he'd done, uh, that he'd illustrated in his book, how to build dioramas and right. that, that also showed up in, some of those inserts and monogram armor kits way oh, back. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, that, there is an entire generation of modelers who mm -hmm. exist today because of those inserts in those kits. Oh, a great inspiration. And yeah. so they had a lot of the. They had maybe oh ten of those, maybe the year, the year before, on display, which were a lot of fun to look at. It's such a good show. Yeah, Mike and I are going to try and plan to get back there next year. Well, before we. Drift back to our subject. One other question: mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you th have you thought about lighting one of your models? Uh, no, but I do have a I do have an idea for a box diorama. Oh, okay, all right. I'll I'll hear about that off the air, but I want to hear about that. <laughs> okay, yeah, I've got an idea. It's gonna be it's gonna take a little bit of effort, but what is it? It wouldn't be worth it if it didn't take effort, right? Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> exactly. Okay, Mike, steer steer us back onto our okay. subject. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Barrister, I forgot why the guy was on trial now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's called filibustering for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I want to talk back to the clear parts and canopies. We were, uh, we were talking about uh, the clear parts. Vac some some kits, especially in I don't want to say the old days, but they came with vacuform parts like if you those old uh, AML volume and yeah. those kind of limited run Eastern European things, and uh, they I guess modelers didn't like them, so then they re reissued the kits and they had the big banner on the front that says now has injected Injection. canopies, you know. Yep. But I always looked at that and said I would have preferred the vac, so. <laughs> I, I humbly suggest you are not most modelers. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but uh, let's see. We talked about um, that and the glues and yeah, the Gorilla Glue. Like I say, I caution you: know, the Gorilla, Gorilla Glue works best. Get the, there's several types though, but get the stuff labeled clear. Clear. Okay. And and the frustrating part about it is that it takes forever to set up. But so, again, that's that's now you you clearly model more quickly than Mike or I either one. But is that really ever an impediment to you? Uh, no, but w w sometimes, um, unlike super glue, where you can, if you've got a piece that maybe doesn't fit as nicely as you'd like it to, so you have to kind of hold it in place. Right. And you get this part anchored in, and, you know, the super glue sets up, and then you can deal with the other part, and that'll set up, and then, you know. But right. this, I guess, with the Gorilla Glue, you have to make sure it's, more of a natural fit all around at first. Cause, Got you. I understand. Uh, that's exactly the only difference. What you're saying. But the beauty of it is it doesn't mar the canopy and it doesn't um, mar the clear parts at all. And I don't know if you remember the, uh, the KI 67 Peggy. Oh yeah. <clears throat> the nose has all that weird internal structure. Yep. 
and uh, there's an old photo etch set by Edward that gives you all that that yep. kind of uh, structure that goes in the nose of the Peggy, and that's the Hasegawa kit. And when I did that, I put all that in there with Gorilla Glue. But the way I'd have to do that is because I'd have to put in just one structural line in the canopy and keep it lined up so gravity wouldn't even make it go one right. way or the other. And then the next night I'd do another one and next another one. But uh, So that's kind of the danger. It just takes a long time to set up, but it's very strong once it does. Um, we talked about the heat and smash technique. Uh, Mattel Vacuform, you can still get those on eBay. Yeah. Uh, the dental vax, uh, you can get that on Micromark, or I think uh, Mike scored one for a better price, I'm sure. I don't know if it was a better price, but it was a better piece of equipment. It's one I can buy spare parts for. Okay. <laughs> for me, that's and, important. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, too, since we're talking about clear parts, um, wingtip lights. Yes. And, oh, yeah. And uh, wing leading edge lights. You often get, uh, we'll talk about wing, wing leading edge lights. Uh, it, you often get a, a piece that comes on the clear sprue in the kit that is supposed to fit in there. And of course it never fits well. And what it's do always, you mean? It always fits perfectly. <laughs> and it's always so thick you can't see anything through it anyway. <laughs> you mean that dimple in the back of it that, that <laughs> just shows up from every angle? <laughs> right. So I, I've learned a trick. So yeah. I never use those pieces. Right. And I'll clean out the, the cavity on the leading edge of the wing and get one of those like railroad MV lenses. You've seen mm -hmm. those. Yeah. And for the light or two lights or whatever, and you, you know, paint it up and set that in, but then for the, and then go ahead and paint it and dull coat it and whatever you do. But at the very end, you have to come back and put in the glazing. And what I use for glazing on the wing tips on the leading edge lights is the, uh, the 3M, uh, shiny clear scotch tape. Really? Yeah. And what you do is cut a piece out. Don't make sure you don't get your fingerprints on it. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then wrap it around from top to bottom mm -hmm. and then take a nice exacto uh, knife and cut out the frame right around the edge of it, just leaving just a little frame and then you peel off the excess and then use a toothpick and burnish down around that. And then you can use some uh, dull coat with a fine brush and just it'll blend it in. And what then you a, get a perfectly clear uh, leading edge light. That's awesome. I would never have thought of that. And a, no fit issues at all. So. I've never <laughs> and, thought of it. Now, what do you do about the curved tip lights? The curved tip lights are different. Um, I learned a technique from uh, uh, Rob Willis. I don't, do you know Rob Willis? Yeah. Okay. He. I mean, not personally, but okay. I know who he is. Yeah, I think you've met him, but yeah. Um, he a while back he taught me a technique. He used to own Hawkeye Designs in out of yep. Iowa when he used to live in Iowa, yep. and we'd occasionally run into him at shows and we'd exchange, you know, ideas. And um, he had some wingtip lights that were just really nice looking. I, How'd you do that? And he says, "Well, what I do is I I never use. He doesn't use the kit part. He uses uh, he cuts it out and then he he." gets the light in there usually with a, uh, maybe a sprue that's been rounded and then painted. And what he does is he, he gets some, uh, super glue accelerator and some super glue, the thick stuff. Right. Puts it on. This is before the model's painted. Right. And takes a toothpick and fills in the cavity and the wingtip with the super glue, hits it with the accelerator, does it again, hits it with the accelerator again. And then waits for maybe 10, 15 minutes and then sands it down. And, and, and polishes it. And polishes it up, yep. And then just mask it with uh, 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 kabuki, kabuki tape or right. or um, uh, liquid mask or something. Does, it, does he put a little future on it uh, as a final touch? Yes. Okay. And that's what I do too. So, okay. And that works great for like the, the wing, the flush wing tip lights, like on right. a BF 109 or. Or I just finished the uh, N1K1 Rex um, yes. that has kind of similar lights on it. So that's a good way to do wingtip lights, and that was a good recommendation. The Japanese ones are colored bulbs with clear covers as opposed to some others that are actually colored covers over a clear light. Right. And what you can do with those, um, let's see. Yeah, mine are going to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that's the spirit. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, they're molded solid. 
Yeah. yeah. It's too late to cut them. Well, it's never too late. They'll be um, fun. I'm not well, cutting them out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you can do for some other wingtip lights, and what I've done in some cases, you can get um, uh, Checkmasters makes uh, navigation I've, lights. I have them. And they yep. make them in clear, green, red, and blue. Blue. Yep. Yep. And, and different multiple shapes. Yeah, teardrop, multiple shapes. Teardrops, yep. uh, um, curved corners, all mm-hmm. sorts of stuff. Yeah, and it's made a translucent resin, but it's yep. tinted. Yep. Yep. And uh, like Mike, like you said earlier, uh, most wingtips are you, the the bulb is colored, but the lens is clear. Right. Some some have the lens might be clear, but the I'm sorry, the lens might be tinted, but the bulb is clear. Right. And for those, you can use actually the, well, I don't want to say the sprue because they're made from resin on the right. Checkmaster sets, but cut off p- part of the holder piece and you can super glue that in and just sand that to shape. Yep. And yep. that works pretty well. And they, they make some uh, pretty good ones. But um, one thing I've been encouraged from lately is I'd love to see Falcon go back and, uh, start uh doing some some more more modern canopies and uh, uh Squ- squadron's been picking them up and reissuing them so that's good too but you can get all the original falcon sets oh yeah they're they're still out there have you yeah. ever reached out to i don't know who that guy is i did a long time ago and i think he he's kind of semi-retired or retired and i think he just said he's not doing it anymore <laughs> well or, I... and he said he thought the the con- the newer kits were didn't need it i think yeah. well yeah I'm good. Well, and now keep in mind, uh, you know, there's, again, Rob Torres. Yeah, Rob Torres makes some very nice ones. Oh, yeah. And and oh, for, even for the most modern kits, I mean, right. it doesn't matter if it's the latest Hasegawa KI-61 dead design models also does the same thing. Of course, focused mostly on the Japanese stuff. Yep, or uh, Pacific War subjects, yeah. Yep. I've noticed uh, dead designs, and one thing they've been doing that I really like lately is, is uh, you know, they do a lot of masks also, but now yes. they're doing combo vac canopy and with the mask with it. Mm-hmm. And yep. that's really good because a lot of times if you substitute a vac replacement for a injected canopy, the masks that are made for that kit – they don't fit or they need some adjustment. Like on the, uh, the Betty I just finished with the, I got a, the mask set comes really nice mask set comes with the kit, but mm-hmm. it needs a lot of adjustment to fit the, uh, the Falcon canopy that I replaced it with. Well, let me ask you, you mentioned something and I want to ask you, cause I, you're removing the masks. You say you use metal needle nose plot or needle nose, uh, tweezers. Or the tip of an exacto blade just to get the, just to lift the corner enough I can grab it with the tweezers. What I've always used is a long toothpick, a long wooden toothpick with the mm-hmm. end sharpened mm-hmm. and then dipped in water so that you can get under it, but it doesn't scratch the clear part because the wa- the wood is wet and, of course, somewhat soft compared to metal mm-hmm, i've mm-hmm. always used a wooden wooden skewer doesn't the to, wood doesn't the wood kind of deform the pointed tip i mean kind of soak into do, the oh, wood and well yes it does but it's still enough to get up under the mask and okay. lift the mask to the point where then i can go in and grab it with the with the tweezers i'll try that i take no i don't i don't risk scratching the clear part ever because okay. the only thing that touches the canopy is the is the wooden the wet wooden tip of the okay. of the that's, that's a toothpick. Good idea. Yeah. And I forget where I saw that, but it really it 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 works really, really well. Okay. I've I'll I've gouged that. I've gouged too many canopies <laughs> with with the, with the with a with a sharp exacto blade tip or scalpel tip. Yeah, it requires a a deft hand. Yeah, and unfortunately, <laughs> we we all know that my hand, for various reasons, is not deft. But you know, Doctor Strangebrush had some great ideas on the last podcast he was on with you guys. Yeah, for the the steadying. Mm-hmm. For he mentioned it for airbrushing. Right, and for uh, the the shooter's rest and the and the yeah for the vice. for the hand right for the hand holding the airbrush and then the the. Uh, the adjustable ball vice for with the putty 
um, for the aircraft. So yeah, it's, that might that, be that'll work for other deal. stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, I made notes of that and there, I might be, those might be in transit to me as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go back because, uh, you're using a lot of, well, it, the answers may depend on whether you're using the kit parts or a squash heat and smash mm-hmm. replacement or a vacuum form canopy. Yeah, or a commercial replacement. Yeah. Right, yeah. So the canopy does not quite fit. So when are you adjusting only the canopy? The kit and when, canopy? And, and, when are, or, and when are you actually maybe taking the sanding stick or the file to the to the canopy frame profile on the top of the cockpit um you're talking about the kit canopy uh or j- just fitting getting the things to fit because what, what i'm wondering is do, do you ever get it close and then come back with with putty or super glue or not super glue but yeah as much as i was bragging about the falcon set fitting the sword g4m1 betty kit like a glove actually the forward part of the windscreen, there was a little issue. And I had, what I did is I, I got the canopy in place around the rear and along the, the side sills fit very nicely. But the front part, there was some gaps where the angle of the windscreen came down and met the fuselage. So what I did, I, I got it uh, anchored in there tight. And then I came back with some uh, Mr. Surfacer 500 and kind of filled in along the front bottom of the windscreen, between the bottom of the windscreen and the top of the fuselage with that, built that up and then taped over the windscreen and then sanded that flush on the front part. So I kind of blended gotcha. and fared it in that way. So, Okay. So you do occasionally come to a situation where you get the canopy to fit the best you can, and then you fill or sand or whatever is necessary to the kit part, the non-clear plastic right. part to adjust to make the canopy. Right. Flush. It's always best. Yeah. It's always best if you can adjust it before you put it on, of course. And right. because you want get you want to get the best fit you can before you, you know, bring the glue out. But um that one, I just wasn't going to get the front. I just had to do some filler there. So well, and that's a that's a particularly unusually shaped canopy mm-hmm. windscreen because it's got kind of a a slight curve to it. Yeah, it does. And and the rear uh, the rear of it had a little issue, but I was able to fare it in uh, without too much issue. But just the front part. But everything else, I got to fit quite well and. And if, if you don't glue on the canopy portions before you paint, then it's very important that you get a really good fit if you're going to put them on after it's painted. Because yeah, yeah, then you, you don't have you don't have time <laughs> to make adjustments then. <laughs> You've cast your lot at that point. Right, right. And you might end up buying a second canopy or something. But You hinted at something else that uh, inadvertent damage to a, a clear pane mm-hmm. or for some reason you're taking out a section of the framing or something. Uh, do you ever do much polishing? And, and uh, I, I guess with the squash molded stuff, that material is probably not lending itself to. Uh, no, in that case, it's, it's so easy to make another one. I just, right. Yeah. So but it'd be a kit part. It would have to be a styrene canopy. Yeah. And, and I think um, again, if you, if you scratch a, a styrene piece uh, that you are going to use and the scratch isn't too deep, you can buff it out and, um, which is successive layers of, you can buy sets of sandpaper that go all the way down to, you know, 12,000, yeah, 12,000. Yeah. And then if you, if it, the scratch isn't too deep or the, or the scuff or whatever it is, isn't too deep, you can easily get rid of it that way and, and then just buff it up. And then, and then a, a nice, uh, future coat at the end, will just bring it all back. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, if you want to send me the canopy, I'll <laughs> I'll do a, do one. You can take a look and decide whether you want to stick with it or use it or not. But one thing I hate doing is, you know, if you're not happy with something, the way something's coming out on a model and and it's you don't want the model to sit on the, on the shelf after it's done and mock you <laughs> <laughs> and say, uh, yeah, you should have fixed this. You should have fixed that. You know, I cannot for, tell you. How many models in my case mock me every time I walk by them? 
Well, you want to avoid that. So that's, that's why all my models are in cases and a room in the basement at the other end of the house that I hardly ever go into. There's mm-hmm. a reason for that. <laughs> Yeah, it's sometimes our laziness gets the best of us. I just don't oh, want to drag out the airbrush again, or I just don't want to do this again. Or I'm tired of this model. I want it to yeah. be done. Mm-hmm. And might and, be where I'm at. Yeah, which which is maybe not. I don't know. That's another. That's another thing about building too slowly. Where again, we were talking faster is better. Uh, faster may make you better. And I think one Mm -hmm. of the areas where it may make you better is that you're not so sick of the model that you'll actually take the time to go back and correct something. Yeah, I think, right. And and once you learn how to make corrections, then the next one is easier and quicker too. And then, so you 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 approach it with a lot more confidence. Yep, I agree. That makes a big difference, yeah. Well, Steve, anything else? Uh, no, I just gonna, just, I mentioned, uh, Edward, you know, I, they do everything else aftermarket. I just love to see him come out with some, uh, vac, uh, replacement canopies for their kits. Kind of like, um, Clearprop does, yeah. you know, you can buy as nice as their KI-51 Sonya kit is. Yep. The canopy is pretty thick and, but they make a beautiful vac replacement for it. So... And I think they make VAC replacements for most of their other kits. I wish Edward would do the same thing. So the precedent's out there for somebody to do something. Well, no, here's what you do, Steve. You call up AK and tell them that you hear that MIG is going to release a line (laughs) of VAC form canopies. Then you call MIG and tell them that you hear AK is going to do that. You're going to have two, two complete lines of canopies like that. And maybe Edward will jump in to boot. And they'll both be beautiful. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, you're right about that. Boy, what AK doesn't do, then or what whatever AK does, ammo does, and vice versa. And yeah. yeah. So you get two sets of everything, but it's all very nice stuff. Oh yeah, no, it's it is improved modeling. There's no yeah. question. No yeah. Question. So yeah, Rob Torres and Dead Designs. I, I love the. Like I say, I love the way Dead Designs. Uh, does back canopies with the masks and yes one thing the masks i I love the kabuki tape masks those i don't care for the vinyl masks so much i agree completely um if it's just flat surfaces you're putting them on they're probably okay but if they're go around a curve they always lift so i'd try and stick to the kabuki tape masks yeah oh one last question yeah you've got your canopy on the model you've Mm -hmm. got your mask supplied Mm-hmm. Before you spray your interior frame color, mm-hmm. do you spray future or some other sealant? I don't. Okay. I do on the theory that it prevents paint creep. It seals the edges of the of the masks. Oh, and pre- okay. And prevents paint creep. Well, in in those cases, what I do with the interior color, I I follow um, uh, John Miller's advice. And he says, put on kind of airbrush a dry, kind of a dry coat first and then get closer in. Gotcha. And he says the dry coat will not, it won't run. Right. Because it, and it's not actually dry. It's just, you know, it's just not wet. And he says what that does, just what you're describing, um, Dave, is that it kind of grabs the, the edge or the perimeter of the masks and kind of seals it in. And then you can come back and kind of build it up from there with little wetter coats with, you know, without worry. So that's kind of what I do. I kind of follow his advice on that one. Gotcha. Well, Steve, thanks for joining us again. It's a, I've got a lot of information here. I got to go. Yeah, me too. Unpack now before I go down and finish this Paul. Yeah, Mike, I'm going to need you to to get this thing uh, <laughs> processed and uploaded because I'm going to have to go back and listen to every bit of it again, making notes. <laughs> it's just well, like, can... Steve, you and, and Dr. Miller, every time we talk with either one of you, I am constantly noting things and and learning stuff. And that's, there could be no higher compliment. Oh, thanks. I, I love it when he's on, too, because I do the yeah. same thing yeah. when he's on. Yeah. Well, when are we going to see you again? Uh, let's see. I'm 
Let's see, maybe Roscoe Ros- Turner? In fact, I got the email from Roscoe Turner the other day making sure we wanted a table. And uh, if you and Mark come down and you have your hotel room, uh, we'll come over after the show and maybe uh, share some refreshments and spend some quality modeling time, a, a mini dojo. That sounds great. That would be fantastic. And then Mike and I are really going to try and make MMSI next year. Oh, you should. That's such a good show. Yep. And it's uh, it's got the well, it's got their own. They kind of pioneered the the open system and right judging and and uh, uh, but it's just it's such a good show. The atmosphere is so nice. The people that put it on are so good, and and the venue is just very nice. And and the vendors yeah. are fantastic. Yeah, they are. I, I always end up dropping a lot of money on books there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All these how-to books. And- yes, I got I, – I, I, I love the text I got from you with the photos of the three books. <laughs> oh, yeah. At, and le- then I, at I, least one of which I'm going to pick up myself. Oh, yeah. And then I bought those two uh, those two Tony kits at uh, Royal yes. Hobbies in Rockford, Illinois, on the way down. And, of course, yeah. I got back, and I realized I had one of them already. <laughs> well, that's okay. But, that's yeah. okay. It doesn't yeah. hurt to have another. <laughs> no, got the razor tops and the bubble tops, and I want to replace yeah. one I did already. So that that'll work. Yeah. All right. Well, we look we look forward to the next time we see you, Steve. And uh, yeah, thanks thanks again for the insight and uh, the wisdom and uh, all the experience you you, you bring to us. And uh, oh, love talking to you guys. And congratulations on passing a hundred episodes too. Again. Okay, we'll have you on for number two hundred. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, have you sit third chair on the wheel in 200? <laughs> All right, we'll do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, Dave, that was uh, good. I learned a lot. I did too. I, now, I was packed with information. I don't think I'm going to try a lot of that stuff on the E16, but uh, I got a lot to think about for the next one. Uh, I, I definitely have a lot to think about for for some upcoming projects. So. And I, it, it may mesh better with what he's done recently, too, because I think one of my next ones, the next plane I'm going to build is probably the Arado AR-196. Well, and, he, uh, he is going to be a fount of information in right, regard to that. He just finished his his up there a little bit before the National Convention this year. And yep. uh, maybe he's got some canopy parts I can <laughs> scrounge off of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That puts us, though, at the Benchtop Halftime Report, Dave. Yep. What have you been doing? What you been doing? I've been building. Uh, I've been... Now, I unlike you, I haven't started anything new, but I have been building the F8. The you know the the wing has been done for quite a while with decals on it and everything. The fuselage is now fully in paint, and decals are going to be going down probably this weekend. If I if I'm not too tired from raking and, and grinding up leaves, but the, the F8 is making forward progress after a stall, and that's good news. In addition, this uh, LCM3 from Trumpeter that I've been building for the 2024 Septemberist group build for D-Day is coming along, uh, making progress on it. More importantly, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Unlike a number of previous group builds where I didn't I didn't have it it felt like a chore. This does not feel like a chore. What I'm doing is a, a ship or a boat, so it's out of my normal modeling area, which I'll be honest with you, it's kind of relaxing from from that standpoint because it's not an airplane. It's not something that is in my wheelhouse. I'm learning new stuff, new areas, new new things. I'm going to get to try some new techniques. The kit is in major sub-assemblies at this point, and probably within the next, uh, well, let's not be too ambitious, within the next two weeks, it's probably going to all be together. And then at that point, uh, painting and weathering and, uh, you know, with a, with a, an LCM, you can really go to town on the weathering. And I kind of want to, 
I want to try my hand at that. Well, sounds good, man. And, and uh, I got, I got to admit it's, it's, it's already seemed to be a more complex kit than uh, I was anticipating or imagining. It is, yeah, it is a little more complex. It's a trumpeter kit from about 15 years ago or so, maybe a little bit older than that. The trumpeter instructions aren't perfect, but the fit is actually pretty darn good if you take your time. And that's that's the key to a all kit assembly is taking your time, test fitting, et cetera. But uh, yeah, no, I'm really jazzed about it. I, I I am enjoying the build. And like I've said previously, I've found now, unlike when I was a younger modeler, that I'm enjoying the build side a little more. And, and this is really feeding into that. Well, percentage wise, how far in are you? Uh. I'm probably as far as construction goes. Yeah. It's in one, two, three, four major sub assemblies. I've actually started a little bit of painting that I can do separately, but those sub assemblies pop together really quickly. And then there's just some detail parts. So I bet, I bet I'm 65 to 75% done with construction. Well, that's good. Yeah. No, it's 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 going it's going really well. I'm very pleased by it. So, uh cuz one of the nice things is once I get it done in construction and start painting it, then I can start something new in construction. <laughs> How about your bench top? Well, I've had a pretty productive week or so. Not two weeks since the last episode, but particularly the this this past week, I did start something new. I started yes, the Moose Rue Cup build, the the Ural truck that we're all doing in seventy second scale. Yeah, um, that's interesting. So, what's the experience been like so far? Oh, Dave, that kid is square pegs, man. Is it square pegs, square pegs, square square pegs? It is. <laughs> uh, it's a flash monster. Okay, it's interesting because there's a good model underneath it all. Yeah. And it's it's not it's not really gross, but there's just I mean every part requires cleanup. requires more than average cleanup. Gotcha. And uh, you're not saying there's huge amounts of flash, but there's a little bit of flash on yeah, everything. And on a few of them, there's a lot, but uh, okay, it's thin and easy to get off. But uh, I've made it through. Well, <laughs> the kit is going to build up into a nice little model. It really is because the the kit has. For a truck in 70 second scale, it's got quite a few parts. Yeah. I think I mentioned that last time. It has about 70 parts or something like that. But about two thirds of that construction is in step one or two where you build the chassis. Right. And uh, yeah, you just need to pay attention to what's going on because there's uh, there's steps on the axles to, for, to set the spacing of the wheel hubs and the, and the leaf springs in the rear and... and I had a little gaff there. I, I set the wheel hubs on the front wheels out too far because the holes in the wheel hubs aren't sized right because they've got flash in them. There's a lot of draft on the holes. Right. So what size is it really supposed to be? It's hard to tell. The instructions, you you, you know, you got a 72nd scale kit, which comes in a 72nd scale size armor kit box. Right. Which means the instruction seat's not very big as far as the size of the drawings. Right. So it's in, in this particular step, it's pretty busy. But if you take your time, you got to think about it a little bit because you can build yourself into a corner pretty quick and not be able to put something in uh, if you don't do it in the right order. But uh, cleaning up the parts, it's been a good project to do on our little online build sessions or our little live uh, chats with our friends. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of that uh, over the weekend and uh, just about got the chassis together. It ought to really pick up pace after that. So. Looking forward to finishing that one up on the construction side. Well, good. Hopefully, not too much longer. I'm not going to make a prediction, though. I, we no, no, about don't it. do that. We're, we're, we've learned our lesson. That's right. Uh, other than that, uh, I started an attempt to vacuum form a canopy for my E16. Posted up a image of a one of the kit canopies I was trying to turn into a vacuum form buck. Quickly realized that for my f- first attempt at a clear part, on a vacuum form machine probably shouldn't be a high value project gotcha. that, I'm, that I'm currently working on. <laughs> yeah. So I think I've abandoned that much to Steve Hustad's chagrin. <laughs> um, He'll forgive you when the kit's done. 
the problem was this the, the kit canopies. I'm 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 doing the, the version, there's two versions. There's the full greenhouse, and there's this, another option that has the the uh the rear gunner and radio operators position open. Right. The but the canopy sections are slid back in. Yeah, they slide forward toward the pilot and right. telescope into each other, two sections. Um the way that part is gated on the mold and the way they failed to process their material pro- properly. There are knit lines in the material, in the clear part. So you, you had this visible line that uh, it wasn't going to polish out because it was through the material. Right. In fact, on one of them, just by handling it, it eventually turned into a crack. It was it was that bad. Yeah. So I was going to just trash them by turning turning one into a buck and vacuuming over it. But uh, uh, the... I don't have the right material and I was wanting to move forward pretty quickly on this because I really want to get the thing done since I got the catapult finished. The, the the kit part also has like weak framing on it and trying to do a, trying to do a vacuum form over a, a male mold mm-hmm. where you're forming over the exterior of the, of the, the master instead of drawing it down into the, an interior cavity. Right. Uh, you're going to lose some of that framing detail. Right. The soft or the sharpness of it. And it wasn't very sharp to begin with. That was the problem. So now you're into sanding it all off and replacing it with something to sharpen it up before you pull a vacuum form part over it. Yeah. Just uh, timing's not right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to throw in the towel on that one. And uh, what I ended up doing was that the mold flaw because of the, was because of the way it was gated. Well, the full greenhouse version of the canopy was gated differently. So it doesn't have the flaw. So I'm like, well, what if I cut it and took the front section off the greenhouse and then took the took the retracted canopy and cut the last little bit off of it and then made them together? Well, I did that and I got it to work out and it glued up pretty nice. And it's a way better looking canopy than the, the retracted version in the kit. Uh, did the old future dip on it about 18 times, seems like, before I finally got one I was happy with. It wasn't 18, but it was more than one. Probably four. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done more than two. Well, you're a pro, man. Well, no, I'm not. You just had to run a bad luck. There was there's a mold de- mold flaw in the in the front windscreen that's on is on the full greenhouse canopy. Right. That I could sand out. Yeah. So I bit the bullet and did that. And that worked out pretty nice. I went through a bunch of sandpaper grits and got that polished out and uh, got it dipped. And finally, one came out without a piece of lint in it and uh, looks pretty good. Well, good. I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. So uh, based on Steve's advice that everybody just heard, uh, I'm going to go going out and buying his recommended adhesive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, get that sucker mask and get it on the model. Then we can start painting again. Yep. Yep, I'm looking forward to that because it again, that kit's been out forever. I don't think I've seen in in all the years that kit's been available. I don't think I've seen a built more than one or two built up at a model contest in all this time. I uh, I don't think I have either. There was one at Nationals, but it was one of those really old LS or something. Right, exactly. One of the really right. ancient one. That, yeah. That doesn't even, it's not even shaped right, really. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I want to get it done, get on the catapult and on that base that uh, was made for me and put it, put a bow on it. Yeah. Yeah. Other, other than that, I've just actually tonight printed a new turret ring for the KV-85. Oh, really? Yeah, the one I had was a little too tall. The okay. Gap between the turret bottom and the top of the hull was too big. So got on the CAD real quick, changed that, threw it on the printer. Now it's in the you might be able to hear it. Hopefully you can't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the uh the post cure machine's running right now. So Gotcha. No, I can't that, hear it. So. That part that part will be done in about twenty minutes. So Okay. So the so you actually have done at least something on the K V as well. Oh yeah, and I've got it. Uh, I've got the top of the turret masked off to spray this extra black paint down in and give that a try. But I got to get the turret ring in it before I can do that. So yeah, uh, I want to know how that goes. That that super black paint. I really want to know what what you think of that and what it what it what it turns out to be. I'm about fifty fifty on whether it's going to make much of a difference. 
Well, if it hi- if it hides if it hides the top of the turret ring, look through the hatches. It'll be worth it. Okay. Well, you'll but, have to report a, report to us. A regular black paint might be good enough. We'll see. All right. I think that's all I've been working on, man. All right. Well, good. Things moving forward. Mike, well, we know you've been building, but have you been buying? Is your wallet broken? I don't think my wallet got broken in the last month. I really don't. I'm trying to think what I, I bought some, to me, extra thin and a bunch of alcohol for my wash station. <laughs> and that really might be it. I'm trying to think if I put a kit in the stash. I don't think I did. I bought some kits down in Tennessee, but I've talked about those already. Right. So, no, I think I got a clean conscience tonight. <laughs> well, I'm I'm not sure that's a clean conscience, <laughs> but yeah, I understand what you mean. Uh, I'm in a similar boat. Uh, I have not added a kit to the stash since, uh, you know, the uh, the IPMS Region 4 Regional here in Louisville, where I, I went a little kit crazy. My purchases, modeling-related purchases, have been confined to, I picked up an Edward Brasson set, 72nd scale M250 calibers because I want to use those on the LCM kit yeah. because the, the, the ones on the LCM kit, the ones that come with the trumpeter kit are really nice. The only problem is that one of the attachment gates is on the perforated jacket and there's, it would be impossible or nearly impossible to, cut that off and then to restore uh that the look of it but brasson makes the exact same gun edward does in their brasson series so i went ahead and bought it i bought some super glue i bought let's see what else oh i've got a a a couple of things on the way it's ordered and on the way a um a vice that uh dr strange brush recommended a bottle of Gorilla Glue that Steve just recommended. Oh, and I bought a book on World War II German uh, naval air operations from 1935 to 42. Uh, It's called, I think, Sea Eagles. Uh, One of the reasons I bought it is it has a whole section on their operations in Norway. Uh, in in April and May of 1940. So that's the reason I bought that. But my conscience is relatively clear. No new kits added to the stash. And the other purchases I made were relatively small. And I just remembered that I did buy something. Okay, what'd you buy? I, you know, I went to the show in Tennessee, and last time we talked about the old friend I met down there. Right. And I mentioned I bought something from him. Right. Which was hasn't been talked about and it's interesting what it is because it, it gets back to michael karnauka's question and my response to you know the uh the soviet subjects during the mystique of the cold war era right how, how my interest kind of flagged after that well i bought a panda models bmd1 oh nice choice <laughs> i think maybe somebody else else is boxing that now or maybe another better kit now but uh that one uh that one I bought. So, well, and that's an interesting looking uh, armored fighting vehicle. I, that's one of the things about the Soviet era armored fighting vehicles. They were always very, very unusual looking. So I did. I did buy a kit. So there you go. Well, good. Good. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. Well, Mike, we're we're at the end of the episode. I assume that your seltzer water has been consumed and and i gotta say i'm almost embarrassed to say those words well just just keep it all above the table man okay be be transparent about what we got going on <laughs> uh, the only upside is i probably won't snore tonight yeah well, that's right that's the so, wife will, the wife will appreciate that there's some value in that so yeah there is marital harmony it's a great thing how's your beer working out do you know what uh this is really good now again, it's four four and a half percent alcohol by volume, so it's it's really fairly light. You you don't get any kick from it. It does have 
and I'm trying to figure out what it is. It has a little aftertaste that I think might be some sort of pepper, like jalapeno. It's not strong, but there's definitely a finish that has spice to it. And it's a really enjoyable beer. I I can take a hard look at the label. It doesn't tell me that brewed. Oh, brewed with agave. Okay. That's not spicy, though. That's not spicy, but maybe that creates the taste that I'm I'm, I'm getting. So, really good beer. I I mean, I, I, I would not turn down one of these if it were handed to me. Like it was at the Nationals. Exactly. <laughs> Do you have any shout outs to wrap up the show? Well, I want to shout out all those who have contributed to Plastic Model Mojo financially. Uh, we do appreciate it. Um, we've got a couple of ways you can do that. If you'd like to make a recurring monthly contribution, you can do that through Patreon. You can go to www.patreon.com slash Plastic Model Mojo. There you can make a contribution of uh, any amount from a dollar on up, and Patreon will handle the, the monthly billing on that. And uh, that's always appreciated. If you'd like to do a one-and-done contribution or manage your own recurring contribution, you can do that through PayPal. And to get to that, you can go to www.plasticmodelmojo.com. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a heart icon that'll take you to our PayPal portal. And uh, there you can take care of that. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It's keeping our expenses in check and uh, making it possible for us to bring you this show. So thank you very much. Absolutely. I second that. My shout out for this episode, uh, I'd like to shout out Mark Copeland, as, as you know, one of my areas of interest is uh, uh, Operation Tidal Wave, the bo- low-level bombing of Ploesti on uh, April or August 1st, 1943. Uh, Mark has a similar interest, and uh, I recently reached out to him because there was a book released in 2021 that I've just started reading, and I reached out to him for his input on it, and then... From that grew a discussion about a project, um, not to, not to sneak peek too much. Uh, I've decided in 2024, I am going to get on with actually building a Ploesti bird. And, uh, there are numerous decal sheets out there. And, uh, I started talking with Mark and, uh, that kind of blossomed into something where we're going to try and put together a little database, a little bit of information in the process of helping me just to decide which of the, which the air, which of the aircraft I'm going to build as my, as my initial one. Sounds good, man. Yeah. Well, we are at the end of this thing. Yes, we are. And Dave, as we always say, so many kids, so little time, man. And uh, we'll see you next time. You got it.